The annual Emma Smith Hymn Festival began at the Kirtland Temple in 2004. Two talented music fellows, Sarah Thatcher and David Bolton, created the interpretive script and hymn selections in commemoration of the 200th anniversary of Emma Smith's birth. A call for musicians, singers, and readers went out to the Kirtland community to help celebrate the elect lady that year. When the night of the event arrived, Sarah, David, and the Kirtland Temple staff welcomed nearly 300 guests to the first hymn festival. It was an incredible evening of church history and song. In fact, the first Emma Festival was such a success that it was repeated a few weeks later and has continued every July ever since. This year, rather than gathering inside Kirtland's historic House of the Lord, like in previous years, the annual tradition is expanding to friends all over the world in an online celebration. Not even COVID-19 can stop us from celebrating the founding mother of our faith community. A special thank you to our friends at the Toronto Center Place and the talented singers in the Beyond the Walls Choir for helping make this special night happen. Loving Lord, we come into this hallowed house to celebrate the life and ministry of Emma Smith. We celebrate her birth and the birthing of the church and her being set apart to write hymns, to be sung in uh, worship, to uh, shout out the theology of the church in harmony. We uh, thank you for uh, her passion for the poor and the downtrodden, the caring ways in which she, she established the, uh, the Relief Society to help those uh, who were in need. We thank you for her, her passion, for her uh, steadfastness uh, through all the trials uh, of her life and her family and the church that she stayed uh, strong to her faith and made uh, statements all her life through song and poetry and just living out her daily life. We thank you uh, for her witness of the living Christ. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus as we, as we celebrate now, amen. Emma Hale was born July 10, 1804, in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Emma was the seventh of nine children raised by Isaac and Elizabeth Hale. 
Her mother encouraged Emma to get an education, so she went to the log schoolhouse in Harmony, went for an additional year at an all-girls school, and eventually returned to Harmony to teach, probably in the same log structure where she sat as a weekly child. As a young woman, Emma was physically and emotionally strong, with a streak of independence. She attended the local Methodist Episcopal Church with her parents and sang the hymns with her lyric soprano voice. A visitor to the Hale home described Emma as fine-looking, smart, and a good singer. Newell and Avery write in their biography, When Emma Hale awoke on a Thursday morning, January 18, 1827, she did not plan to be married by evening. Joseph had asked for Emma's hand twice and had been rebuffed, not by Emma, but by her father. Emma and Joseph again discussed marriage while visiting the Stowell home that day. Later in life, Emma relates, preferring to marry him to any other man I knew, I consented. Before the day was over, Joseph and Emma were married at South Bainbridge, New York. We invite you to sing a lovely song from Emma's 1835 hymnal to a well-known 17th century tune. This hymn is the only hymn on marriage that she included in the first church hymnal. after Emma's baptism in June 1830, the following revelation was given through Joseph Smith at Harmony, Pennsylvania. It is the only revelation addressed solely to a woman. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called, and thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures and to exhort the church. And it shall be given thee also to make a selection of sacred hymns, as it shall be given thee, which is pleasing unto me to be had in my church. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me. The revelation was first printed in the 1833 Book of Commandments. On May 1st, 1832, W. W. Phelps was given the task to correct and print the hymns which had been selected by Emma Smith in fulfillment of the revelation. The first issue of The Evening and Morning Star came off Phelps's press in June. Redeemer of Israel was among the six hymns printed in this issue. Inspired by a hymn by Joseph Swain, Phelps rewrote the song, capturing both the excitement and struggles of the new movement, comparing the trials of the church to those of the ancient Hebrews. Redeemer of Israel has since become the well-loved song of the saints.
On 1 June 1833, God called the saints in Kirtland through revelation to build an house dedicated unto me. The construction of the temple became very much a part of the community life. Men and women gave much of their time and effort in helping to build the temple, and Emma took in workers as boarders. By September 1835, Emma was again working on the selection of hymns to be published. This new hymnal came off the press, then located very near where we are now standing, just in time for the dedication of the temple on 27 March, 1836. Adam on Diamond was sung at the dedication and quickly became one of the most frequently sung hymns in the early years. The song was included in all of Emma's subsequent hymnals. We will sing Adam on Diamond using the melody and bass line in an unofficial hymnal published by J.C. Little and C.B. Gardner in 1844. It was the first hymnal to include actual music for any Latter-day Saint hymn. All other Latter-day Saint hymnals before 1889 were words only. In 1838, church members were starting to move out of Kirtland into far west Missouri and eventually to Nauvoo, Illinois. On 9 May 1839, Emma moved her family into this small two-story log house where I join you today from Nauvoo. Emma would spend the last 40 years of her life in Nauvoo. One of the first enterprises the saints established in Nauvoo was the Times and Seasons newspaper. Hymn scholar Richard Clothier states 
the 131 issues of the paper from November 1839 to February 1846 contain an amazing outpouring of literature, scripture, poetry, and news. In November 1840, the Times and Seasons published this notice. Hymns, Hymns, having just returned from Cincinnati, Ohio, with paper and other materials for publishing a new selection of hymns, which have so long been desired by the saints, we contemplate commencing the work immediately, and feeling desirous to have an extensive and valuable book. It is requested that all those who have been endowed with poetical genius, whose muse has not been altogether idle, will feel enough interest in a work of this kind to immediately forward all choice others, we mean all who have good hymns that will cheer the heart of the righteous man, to send them as soon as practic practicable, directed to Miss Emma Smith, Nauvoo, Illinois, postpaid. The next song we will sing is a poem from the Times and Seasons written by a visitor to Nauvoo named Laura. We will sing it to the tune Materna, commonly associated with America the Beautiful. On March 17, 1842, Emma and 19 other women met with Joseph here in the red brick store in Nauvoo to form the Nauvoo Female Relief Society. Their objective, according to Joseph Smith, was that the sisters might provoke the brethren to good works in looking to the wants of the poor, searching after objects of charity, and administering to their wants to assist by correcting the virtues of the female community. The sisters in attendance would unanimously elect Emma as the president to preside over the society, just as the presidency preside over the church. In just two short years, membership grew from the original 20 to approximately 1,341 members. Today, there are over 4 million women involved in the Relief Society in more than 160 different countries and provinces. The hymn, Now Let Us Rejoice, was sung at the close of the first Relief Society meeting. 
The minutes of the Kirtland Temple dedication indicate that Now Let Us Rejoice was sung to the tune Hosanna, the same tune used for the Spirit of God. Today we will use this tune to sing Now Let Us Rejoice. As Joseph left for Carthage jail, Emma's eyes filled with tears. Oh, Joseph, she said, you are coming back. Joseph returned twice more before saying his final goodbyes. And on June 27th, 1844, inside a Carthage jail, Joseph and his companions languished in the afternoon heat. John Taylor later recorded, all of us felt a remarkable depression of spirits. In consonance with those feelings, I sang a song that had lately been introduced to Nauvoo, entitled, A Poor Wafering Man of Grief. After a lapse of time, Brother Hiram requested me again to sing that song. I replied, Brother Hiram, I do not feel like singing. When he replied, oh, never mind, commence singing and you will get the spirit of it. At his request, I did so. Sometime later, the mob stormed the jail and shot into the small room. When the fire and smoke subsided, Joseph and Hiram were dead. Joseph's body was brought back to Nauvoo in a rough pine casket for a proper funeral. And at the funeral, Emma, the young widow, sank upon her husband's body. Suddenly her grief found vent and sighs and groans and lamentations filled the room. <laughs> Oh, 
nine o'clock on the morning of November 17th, 1844, five months after Joseph's death, Emma gave birth to David Hiram here in the Smith family homestead behind me. Eliza R. Snow visited and wrote a poem about the infant born to a world without a father. Sinless as celestial spirits, lovely as a morning flower, comes the smiling infant stranger in an evil omened hour. Not to share a father's fondness, not to know its father's worth, by the arm of persecution, tis an orphan at its birth. Smile, sweet babe, thou art unconscious of thy great untimely loss. The broad stroke of thy bereavement, Zion's pathway seemed to cross. Thou mayest draw from love and kindness all a mother can bestow. But alas, on earth, a father thou art destined not to know. Following the death of her husband and birth of David Hiram, Emma elected to remain in Nauvoo with her family, while church leaders and their Latter-day Saint followers scattered throughout the country. Within a few years, she found friendship and support in Louis Bittemann, a local man whom she married on December 23rd, 1847. Louis assisted Emma in raising her five children, and he remained her companion until the end of her years. In the spring of 1879, Emma had a dream that the prophet came and took her to a beautiful mansion. In one of the rooms was a baby, her child, Don Carlos, who died as a toddler. She dreamed she caught the child up in her arms and wept. When she regained her composure, she asked Joseph where the rest of the children were. He assured her that if she would be patient, she would have them all. In her old age, Emma continued to grow weaker. By April, all of Emma's children found their way here to the Riverside Mansion, also known as the Nauvoo House. Joseph III kept a day-by-day -day account of Emma's declining health. During the night of April 29th, Joseph saw his mother rise herself up and extend her left arm. Joseph, he heard her say, yes, yes, I'm coming. Emma died at 4.20 a.m. on April 30th, 1879. Her memorial service was held in a room just downstairs, Emma's parlor, on Friday, May 2nd, and she was buried just across the street near Joseph and Hiram in the family cemetery. The next song we will sing, Asleep in Jesus, Blessed Sleep, was among the hymns sung by the choir at Emma's funeral. With Emma's passing, she left behind a collection of hymns that continue to influence the Latter-day Saint hymnals of today. Emma's love of song lives on, and the Latter-day Saint movement continues to be a singing people. Emma's son, David Hiram, would in turn greatly influence the hymnody of the early reorganization. 
quote, it appears that he inherited his father's ability to articulate language into a smooth, charismatic form, while also using his mother's gifts and talents in the area of music, unquote. His older brother, Joseph Smith III, born in the Whitney store in 1832, also had a talent for hymn writing. Both brothers authored a number of hymns published in various hymnals over the last century. Jan and I are reading this today from Liberty Hall, home of Joseph Smith III here in Lamoni, Iowa. Emma's granddaughters, Vida E. Smith and Mary Audentia Smith Anderson, spent time in this home. They continued Emma's musical legacy in writing a beloved hymn known as There's an Old, Old Path. Vida, the hymn's author, was born in 1865 at Nauvoo, the daughter of Alexander Hale and Elizabeth Kendall Smith. Like her uncles, Vida was inspired to write the hymn during an experience of worship here in Lamoni. She tells the story. It was after a tedious Sunday school session one Sabbath, a glorious summer day. I came up from the primary rooms in the brick church in Lamoni and seated myself in the usual place on the north side of the church. A slight breeze moved the branches of the trees near the window. Birds flitted about and called or sat on some swaying branch, singing in the Sabbath softness. The choir sang and someone prayed, all as usual. The minister read his text, that old favorite, about finding the old path and walking therein. He soon faded from my realization as my eyes rested on the swaying branches of the trees and the soft clouds against the blue sky, and I felt the nearness of congenial friends. I felt at home in the house of God, and I felt at ease before his mercy seat. The glory of the message of the ancient prophet flooded my soul, and opening my quarterly, I wrote on the flyleaf the words of the song exactly as they appear in the hymnal. With the encouragement of a friend, Vida showed the lines to her cousin, Mary Audentia, daughter of Joseph III and Bertha Madison Smith. Mary Audentia quickly composed the tune to a hymn that continues to inspire.
This evening, from the comfort of our own homes, we have visited the historic places that impacted Emma's life and her legacy. We went to the site of the Kirtland Print Shop where her first hymnal was published. We saw inside the Kirtland Temple where Emma would have attended the temple dedication in 1836. Together, we visited the homestead, the first place she called home in Nauvoo. We saw inside the upper room of the red brick store where Emma and the women of Nauvoo organized the Relief Society, and years later, where her family gathered for Sunday worship with a small branch of the reorganization in the 1860s. Finally, we went inside the Riverside Mansion, the home located alongside the Mississippi River where Emma passed away in 1879. Tonight, we have witnessed the impact that one woman's story has made on the many generations that followed. This evening, each one of us has the opportunity to ensure that Emma's timeless story of resilience and strength, the story that is shared at Community of Christ Historic Sites today, continues to be shared for the benefit of present and future generations. Help us preserve Emma's legacy with an online donation this evening using the link you see in the comments. Donations are also welcome through the mail at the Nauvoo address you see also in the comments. Thank you for your generosity and thank you for singing along with us tonight in the annual Emma Smith Hymn Festival. It is fitting that we bring the close of our experience with a hymn that is dear to the hearts of every Latter-day Saint, a hymn that grew out of the Pentecostal experiences here in Kirtland prior to the completion and dedication of the temple. Tongues, visions, and prophecies were enjoyed on several occasions. In one particular quorum session, those attending reported a great flow of the Holy Spirit like fire in their bones so that they could not hold their peace, but were constrained to cry, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. With his poetic gifts, W.W. Phelps formulated the words of a hymn that captured the powerful spirit of this remarkable period. Immediately after its publication in The Messenger and Advocate, the new hymn was printed as the last entry in Emma's hymnal which actually came off the presses only a few weeks before the temple was dedicated. Set to a stirring English tune, the Spirit of God, like a fire is burning, was sung at the temple dedication. I am joining you from one of those choir lofts this evening. Let us stand and sing this powerful hymn with the same enthusiasm and energy as Emma Smith and the early saints at the dedication service 185 years ago.
us pray. God of grace and God of wonder, source of all being, past, present, and future. Our hearts overflow in gratitude for the outpouring of song, lyric, and faith journey brought to life through the many gifts and voices sharing in this festival of worship and celebration. Your spirit has blessed us in full measure. We are reminded once again, O oh God, that it is you who called this movement into being and you who calls us still to the great and marvelous work. For there is so much yet to see, so much yet to do. Thank you for the life and witness of our beloved Emma, her steadfast faith in the face of desperate uncertainty, her courage to lean into the unknown with unwavering trust, her wisdom, leadership, grace-filled servitude, and keen intellect as she traveled without falter the way of suffering love never hesitating to speak truth to power. In her story, we see our story. In our story, we see the sacred story, your story, O oh God, unfolding generation after generation. Your story made known to us through Jesus Christ and the continuing, at times, burning presence of the Holy Spirit. Write it on our hearts anew. Teach us how to love. Empower us to be good and just and wise. Guide us in times of trouble, despair, and dark unyielding gloom. Grant us courage to boldly respond to our prophetic call that we might live as lights on a hill reflecting your vision for all creation. Shape us and form us a people of the temple, restoring, renewing, reimagining dedicated to the pursuit of peace, reconciliation, and healing of the spirit. Loving God, make us one in Christ that we may wholeheartedly trust what is being born, have faith in divine purposes, and ever always persist in hope. In the name of Jesus, the peaceful one who showed us how. Amen.